Thank you so much for that, Mr. Kionotz. You can take a seat. I brought with me another panelist. Sit here. Mr. Kiholz, you can uh, sit back and relax for a moment. I'm just going to uh, introduce the other panelist, uh, Professor David Imus, UBS Foundation Associate Professor of Economics of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the Department of Economics at the University of Zurich. You all have very long titles, it seems, but yes. uh, <laughs> maybe it's a sign of, of how important you are and how important your work is. Uh, a reminder to the audience, I see that many of you have sent in your questions. I would encourage you to continue to do that. Um, but thank you so, so much for what you've sent in so far. I mean, um, David, if I can just start off by asking you a very, maybe a simple, very straightforward question. We know that climate change matters to scientists. Why is it so important to economists? Yeah, so it, it matters for economists because it's, it's really actually an economic question. There are questions of trade-offs. How much output do I want to sacrifice today for more uh, output and more welfare generally tomorrow? There are questions of what type of policies do I want to design? So this is a question of uh, uh, you know, trying to get the right incentives for people to uh, reduce uh, carbon emission, for innovators to introduce uh, cleaner technologies. Um, and in fact, actually, you know, not only it's an interdisciplinary question between uh, economics or, and uh, environmental sciences, it, within economics, it's really about, uh, uh, it really involves all subfields. So the question of political economy, of microeconomics, et cetera, et cetera. All right, David, in your newest publication, you focus on the role of innovation in the design of, of climate policies. Uh, just as, give us a sense of what you found there and why you're saying that innovation may not always be the silver bullet, because I found that quite interesting. Yeah, so what we, what we find is that actually if you take into uh, account the fact that innovation is endogenous, so it responds to uh, the policies uh, that are going to be uh, put in place, then that, that changes the policies that you want to put in place in the first uh, initially. So for instance, you actually need uh, policy instruments that are going to directly incentivize uh, innovation. Um, that also actually makes you wanting uh, to have your policies more front-loaded, that is, relatively higher actions uh, to start with. And, and the, why is innovation not uh, just a silver bullet? Well, first, it's, it's actually uh, costly. You need to put resources in, the, in innovation. All innovation is not green. Most innovation is, is actually either neutral or dirty, and so you need to redirect uh, innovation efforts towards uh, clean technologies. And in fact, sometimes innovation can uh, can backfire, so you can. Such as, I mean, can you? Yeah. Give us an so example? one example would be uh, the shale gas revolution, which uh, you know has actually reduced emissions in the short run in uh, in the U.S. because you substitute uh, coal with natural gas, a fossil fuel, but a much much uh, cleaner fossil fuel. However, at the same time, what we've seen is that there has been a decline in real, uh, really green innovation, uh, perhaps as a, as a result of the development of, uh, of uh, shale gas. So we see a decline in uh, renewables uh, in electricity compared to fossil fuels in the US and, in fact, across the world since 2010 or so. So what should governments do then? I mean, on the one hand, you want them to incentivize research in, in green R&D obviously. Yes. On the other hand, if it's too much, you are maybe crowding out innovation. And I guess, you know, one of the problems, what we're seeing in the U.S. right now, maybe President Biden is doing all the right things. He's trying to um, funnel a lot of money into innovation in the green space, but there's so much political pushback from, you know, even from within, you know, his, his own party. So in reality, it's more difficult than it is in theory, correct? No, so that, of course, there's a lot of, uh, you know, political uh, pushback. Uh, so I think the first thing is that you actually probably want to have well-designed policies. Um, you know, it's going to be easier if, to implement a policy, actually, if that policy is well-designed and then brings, uh, brings results. So I think that's the first thing you want to think carefully about the policies you're pushing for. And the second, you, you have opposition from some parts uh, in society. You also want to kind of enlist the ones that are actually going to uh, benefit uh, from your policy intervention. So be it you know, your younger generations that are going to suffer more from uh, climate change, businesses that may suffer more uh, from climate change. And maybe just to give one, one example, actually, that again is related to, uh, to, sh to shale gas. Uh, you have huge leaks uh, in the, when you uh, exploit uh, shale gas and shale oil, and there is a tremendous amount of heterogeneity uh, for, this, for the different wells. So if you just put a tax on 
all uh, uh, you know, all wells that, uh, that use natural gas and just a uniform tax, you're going to have everybody against you. But if you actually try to target and compute, the, make uh, this really related to the emission uh, generated by each well, then you'll have most of the industries probably in favor of it because the, you really, what you really want to do is shut down the dirtiest firms. Mm -hmm. All right, let's continue. And, and by the way, um, I think everyone should, should read that paper. It is called Public Paper on Green Innovation Policies, correct? Let's move on to the poll question. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Let's see what the result is. Once again, the poll question was as follows. What is the estimated loss of total economic value by mid-century if climate change stays on the currently anticipated trajectory and the Paris Agreement and the 2015 net zero emissions target are not met? 20%. Majority of you actually went for 20%. The correct answer was, well, it depends on the assumption. <laughs> it, always As depends on the it always depends on the assumption. Um, I, I hear the laughter from the economists in the first row was especially loud. Um, if the world goes to a more severe scenario of 3.1 percent, I should um, 3.1 degrees. I should clarify um, to the increase by mid-century global GDP would be almost 20 percent lower. So for 3.1 degrees. 20%, that is the correct answer. If we stay between an increase of 2.2 to 2.6 degrees by mid-century, we would see a shortfall of 10%. I think what you were talking about in Securities was the actual 10%. I mean, let, let me come back to you, and you alluded to you know, some part of the role that your industry, the insurance and reinsurance industry, can play in your presentation. What do you think is the scope of what you can actually do in terms of the mitigation and the adaptation to climate change? You know, the, the, the trigger uh, or the, the, the pain point is uh, liability insurance. As I say, it's the insurance a company has to take out because it's sued for killing people and poisoning the ground, whatever. And uh, it is very clear that at one point in time, uh, there will be class action suits, uh, uh, very strong class action suits, against uh, companies which are considered to be climate dangerous. There's no question, all over the world. So for a shareholder of such a company, as long as he finds uh, somebody who is underwriting these risks for him, taking this potential loss which you will have away from him, uh, he has relatively little incentive uh, to change. Uh, if that price for this cover becomes very, very high, the economics of the company change. And the shareholder will say, wait a second, maybe it's cheaper we do something about the problem in the first place than try to find a fool who is underwriting our risk, even at a very high price. So that's the mechanism uh, how this works. It has worked in many other things which, are, for ex which have been in the past. So for example, medical malpractice, which has been a big problem in the United States, that class action suits have actually produced a behavior of hospitals and professional, uh, professionals in the medical professions that has reduced dramatically the malpractice claims. So it, 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 it can work. And uh, if uh, the world uh, uh, risk markets are refusing to underwrite those risks, not because they are good people, that's not necessary, because they have the right judgment about what the heck is the risk which I really take now on my balance sheet. Should I really do that? And should my shareholders then carry all that risk? Are they actually in agreement with such a policy? Or do they think I'm reckless? And so that will be the mechanism, how it works. I mean, in, in your industry, there's a, so much talk about social inflation. Are you talking about the sort of... The social, social inflation is something different. But are you, taking, are you talking about it from the climate perspective? Is, is that something that is becoming more and more important? No, social inflation is something that, that has to do with individual people's claims, mm -hmm. mostly motor car business and so on, which inflates the, in, the cost of the individual claim. This is a different story. This is something where a new risk, and, and that means uh, governments could also uh, play an important role by toughening the liability uh, uh, regimes around those risks and say, 
uh, every uh, uh, so-and-so uh, company in this and this business has to actually prove to the regulator that they have somebody who underwrites the risk. And they are liable for what they create. Also this will be a fairly strong, sometimes dramatic process. And of course, as you said before, the political uh, pushback uh, can be well organized, as we see, for example, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, the weapons lobby in the United States, how successful the pushback can be in something which is not really so uh, controversial mm -hmm. <laughs> in, 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 with many people. Mm -hmm. But the pushback is enormous. Before we get to the audience questions, maybe um, a final quick question to you, Mr. Kiholtz, about, you said it in your presentation yourself, we're not doing enough in a way, and we always hear this when it comes to what the governments are spending, uh, what the society and the businesses are doing to stop the effects of climate change. Um, if the sort of peer pressure isn't working, what other mechanisms are there, you think, that are quite useful? Yeah, also, it is probably taking longer than is good for the world. Hmm? These things take some time, and if I compare the acceptance of this kind of uh, this debate about climate risk and compare it with 20 years ago, a, a lot has changed. But it took, it takes very long. And we just recently had in Switzerland uh, also a uh, referendum vote where we then realized how big the pushback can be if you want to have a, an all-inclusive policy for a small step, but nevertheless an all-inclusive policy the enemies of individual steps, if you add them all up, are a majority. And therefore, very often, these kind of uh, political uh, plans and pledges are not realizable in the theater of political, in the public court of public opinion. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, yeah, I wonder, I wonder, because what you hear when you see these activists protest, and then when you see the polls, what the people are really thinking, it's a big gap. It's still a big gap. Mm -hmm. And so since we are a democracy, I don't know how we can actually solve this conflict. I don't, I don't know. You cannot just say, oh, well, you know, we do it anyway. We don't want to hear you anymore. You cannot. David, um, I don't know how much you know about the CO2 law, which was very narrowly rejected in Switzerland this summer, just to uh, pick up on what Mr. Kirot said there. But, but obviously, it, you know, a lot of people were concerned about the, the associated cost. <laughs> Does it even matter for, and maybe this is a bit controversial, but, you know, for, for a small country like Switzerland, which has a very, very small carbon footprint, um, to have a law like this? Because we're, we're very, very small emitters compared to China, India, for example. Yeah, so I mean, it, it's true that, you know, even if Switzerland were to completely cut its emissions uh, tomorrow to zero, that won't really change the, the trajectory uh, of the world. Uh, it still matters because we're trying to have a global agreement. So the more countries actually do something, uh, the easier it is to have a global agreement. We are, um, you know, different countries can set uh, examples too. And Switzerland is rich, so it can afford to, to, cut, uh, to cut emissions. I would say that in the case of a country like Switzerland, it also matters a lot to redirect innovate, to direct innovations uh, towards clean technology, because even if you are you know, cutting emissions to zero, and that's the best you can do on the emission side. On, on the innovation side, if you invent uh, you know, better uh, solar panels, if you do direct uh, carbon capture, these are, pla these are places where even a small country can have actually have a very large impact. Mm -hmm. So it's really about exporting uh, the innovation. Then you can export exactly mm -hmm. the innovation. Okay, let me get to some of the audience questions. I'm looking for the ones with the most thumbs up. Um, <laughs> so there you go, Mr. Kiedehoitz, this, this one got uh, quite a lot of uh, thumbs up. In your personal view, what are the three key measures that Switzerland should adopt immediately to fight climate change? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <that's a> <laughs> I think uh, we, we have a, a tremendous advantage if we get our electricity and uh, uh, power policy right that we can make the transition to much less carbon use in the country. Unfortunately, 
it seems to be that uh, this electricity policy at, uh, has also got stuck somewhere, and the, the, and the, uh, and the, the opinions that this is uh, not enough, uh, we are, will not produce enough electricity to actually uh, fulfill this ambition are getting louder. I'm not uh, so deep into the story that I can judge that, but I think to make, to give the people uh, uh, sort of confidence that there will be always enough energy, electrical energy in the country would be, would take us a long way, politically a long way. The second is we have to convince people that this country with its high tech uh, um, industry, with its universities, which is Etihad and so on, will be in so far leading and will probably also profit from innovation and technology change. It is not a zero-sum game, it is for Switzerland probably a win. If we really adopt innovation, investment in innovation, investment in research and in our uh, universities and uh, technical schools. That's certainly, based, and, and I'm not, I'm, I'm more a fan of, of things which make people behave in a certain way because they believe what they are told, because they believe that uh, innovation and technology innovation for Switzerland will be a good thing. It will produce a lot of jobs, high value jobs. And I'm pretty sure. And then second, of course, we have to somehow, uh, and I'm not uh, a green or socialist politician, not really, but we have to solve uh, the inner city problematics uh, with, with traffic, uh, and with a more efficient way to, to the board for the solution of mobility in inner cities. I think that these are three small things which we can do, but I think in particular the innovation and investment case is a strong one. I hope this is shared by the president of ETH. <laughs> On that point, and I think this also plays into your research, uh, David, how can we incentivize, another question, first movers on and uh, scale clean technology in the absence of enough lost data, uncertainties, and high competition? So you, you can try to subsidize uh, innovation directly, so that, that's one way. You're going to lose some money, and you know, a lot of subsidies are not going to give you anything, but that's fine. I mean, you, the goal is not to create uh, you know, thousands of different companies that are going to, uh, to reduce emissions. The goal is to create a couple that are going to be very good at it. Um, now, at the same time, that it is true that having a price on carbon that makes it uh, more concrete, uh, how, what, uh, you know, what, is a, what is the value of, uh, of the CO2 emission is also something that's going to, that would help uh, incentivize innovation. Yeah. yeah, but there are a lot of shortcomings when it comes to the carbon price. We're going to be discussing that later. To, it's difficult to have, mm -hmm. but it is, uh, it is, I think it is, remains an important ingredient. Absolutely. And uh, I think in your paper, you also point on potentially one of the difficulties is having maybe a global carbon price. There's carbon leakage. What is that about and, and how can you solve that, that question or that problem? Yeah, so, so basically if you, have, if you don't have a, a global uh, carbon price, but only in some places of the world you have leakage in the sense that the places that have a large uh, carbon price are going to you know, import uh, the uh, emission intensive goods from, uh, from the rest of the world. Um, so you can imagine putting in place carbon tariffs, that's a way to somewhat uh, reduce the leakage. It's easier to do on relatively homogeneous uh, goods, so think about steel, cement, and on very, very uh, complex, uh, complex goods. And the way in which innovation plays a role there is that actually if you think about the effect of, uh, of endogenous innovation, then the leakage problem becomes worse. If I import all of my energy intensive goods from China, then that's actually going to uh, incentivize uh, more Chinese investment in energy intensive goods. And unless there is a political will there, it's likely that this investment is going to be uh, rather dirty uh, and not clean. All right, let me move on with another question to Mr. Kirhoz. You just gave the example of a GDP boost when an earthquake happens in Chile. Is there a need for a different calculation of GDP or a completely alternative measurement of successful economies? That this debate about successful economies is as old as economies are, and uh, there is a certain um, 
in every, in every country, in every uh, society, there is a certain attitude. And you could ask, uh, for example, why is Switzerland a successful economy? Why is, uh, is so-and-so a successful economy and its neighbor not? It has a lot to do with the, with the attitudes and the, the values in a society. And um, uh, so therefore, uh, you cannot easily transport these kind of attitudes. This, uh, there are countries like Switzerland, Holland, the United States, where you insure against everything. And there are parts of the world where you don't insure against anything, but you go, you go to church on Sunday and think it helps. Huh? And uh, th this is, a, I would not even start to try and change these kind of uh, attitudes, it's, it's, it's a fact. Now, individual companies, and that is uh, what I say here also about this leakage question, I'll just pick it up. Why should, uh, 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 why should companies behave differently with CO2 costs than they did with labor costs? Meaning, immediately, companies were flocking to the places where labor costs were lowest. And, uh, of course, we, we know exactly in Switzerland how it feels if you lose all these jobs, which we had in textile, which we had in cloth manufacturing, which we had even in some parts of the machine tool uh, industry and lost these job to low job uh, areas. And I can see that the, with CO2 costs, it will be exactly the same. It is how, uh, how markets operate. And if you start to stop that, why, why were you not able to stop the low, uh, uh, because you, you, the low uh, salary uh, competition, if you want, the low job competition. Because you, the, the world at that time said open trade is a value in itself. It helps the poor countries to grow and to produce jobs in poor countries, which was true. It destroyed these jobs in, 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 in top economies like Switzerland. And the same thinking will go on in CO2, I'm pretty sure. So the leakage is, in my view, unavoidable. Mm -hmm. I think we've got uh, time for one or two more questions. Um, Mr. Kirots, let me continue with you. Um, a question here that is seeing a lot of support from the others. Uh, do you have an estimate of how much it would affect oil and carbon industries not being able to have insurance? <laughs> Nothing. It will change nothing. The, the, the amazing piece was the oil and gas industry, in particular the extraction. When uh, this uh, uh, drilling platform in the Gulf of Mexico took fire, burned down, BP was the owner of that platform, but actually it was not the owner of that platform. There were a lot of companies between them and the risk. And BP had not one single dollar of insurance. Why? They say to the risk markets, look, our capitalization is so much larger than yours. We don't need you. And when the prices for uh, energy risks, in the, in, uh, offshore energy risks, uh, tripled or went up four times about 10 years ago, they just canceled all the insurance policies and said, we carry it ourselves. We protect ourselves by hiding behind these companies which all own these places. And when it came to this big loss, BP was told by President Obama, I don't care about your legal structure. You pay 25 billion. By the end of next month, thank you very much, you can leave. And so they realized there is ultimately a cost of risk which you cannot organize away by a whole army of lawyers. It, mm -hmm. is, it sticks at the end. And here the same with, uh, with climate risk, I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. It's quite interesting. I didn't know that fact, um, and it turned out to be quite costly. Um, okay, uh, maybe a, a final question. Is the political pushback, the result, because we were talking about that before, David, the, the result of doubt about climate change or its cost, or is it about the lack of reimbursement of those put at a disadvantage by transition policies such as carbon pricing, or I personally may add, is it all of the above? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to know what, uh, what causes this exactly, right? So I think part of it is that it is harder possibly to, 
implement uh, an action in just one country if you know that this is not going to be uh, also done elsewhere because you know why should we pay if uh, Ch China Russia doesn't pay so that thing that you know the fact that we don't have a global agreement actually makes individual uh, individual countries actions more difficult and there are huge questions of redistributions I think that's true so the way in which you think about what to do with the proceeds uh, of the carbon price the carbon tax uh, how you compensate people, uh, I think that, that, that's, key. Uh, mm -hmm. that's key here. W what do you think is a good way of redistributing some of the proceeds? Is it sending a simple check or is it, you know, um, I don't know, tax cuts? No, I think, I, think that, I think it needs to be transparent. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can, uh, you can sending a check as the advantage of being very transparent. It's probably, uh, it's probably not the best use of the money to, uh, at the same time because you could uh, use that money to actually finance uh, clean innovation uh, or you could use that money to lower taxes elsewhere. Uh, but I think at this point in terms, when we're thinking about trying to introduce uh, a carbon price and perhaps the most important uh, part is to think about the feasibility and the political feasibility and if we think that uh, the sending the check is the most feasible mm -hmm. then maybe that's that's a way to act at least start mm -hmm. mr keholtz do you have any views on okay on what the best way would be in switzerland there's quite i guess a mechanism where people get the money back and in other countries it might be quite different i i guess you would agree that it is important to compensate to recompensate those who are the most badly hit correct yeah but the, the the more complicated the whole system then becomes the more difficult to explain the more less the, the less credibility it has with the people and then as i said before you will then mobilize uh, enemies of parts of your ideas all over the place and those many enemies will then all of a sudden kill the whole thing as I, I would keep it very simple and very, uh, 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 very much uh, trimmed to the local circumstance because if it's too complicated, nobody gets it. It's already now complicated. Mm -hmm. Let me squeeze in a final question. Um, how can reasonable policies to limit climate risk be implemented in democracies if large parts of the population do not support these and most politicians pursue personal interests above all. Uh, David, do you want to uh, take this one? Called democracy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, I think you need to convince the population uh, that it's a good, uh, good cost-benefit, right? So mm -hmm. it makes sense to uh, cut emissions and do something because that's going to be good, uh, good in the future. So that's, that's the first part. I think you also want to explain that it's actually feasible. We're not just trying to reduce emissions just to feel, uh, just to feel good or for some more, more, just for some more reason. Uh, it's feasible to decarbonize the economy. It's costly, but the costs are not gigantic either. Uh, so it's kind of, you know, if you convince people it's feasible, you don't need to change all of your life uh, and go back to become cavemen, uh, then uh, if, you, if, if you explain that, it, must, it should be uh, easier. But it's... Uh <laughs> well, you know, we had in Switzerland several of these uh, situations. If I think back, I haven't been around at that time when we had the first vote about the public pension scheme, AHAFA. Four times it was refused, I think, or three times at least it was refused by the, uh, by the referendum. But they kept on working on it, and I think today it's, it's something which people think without it, they can't even imagine how it was. The same was true with mandatory uh, health insurance. The, the same was true with other things. Where, you, For example, I remember the smoking ban in restaurants, which I still think for a cigar smoker is slightly tough. <laughs> but uh, um, the, at the beginning we said it will never work. It worked. So the population, I think, will, will uh, adopt political reforms when they are somehow convinced. I only see one slight uh, 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 a difficult situation there. Already, still 20 years ago, 15 years ago, the political parties played a very important role in the opinion-making process. You were a member of a party or a member of a society, which adopted the party, and when this party then said you should agree to that, then you said, oh, oh okay, maybe. Today, uh, uh, I think these political parties have lost 
der, uh, what we call in German, uh, Deutungshoheit. And people don't believe what they say anymore anyway. And so who, to whom do they listen? And we have seen now with the pandemic uh, uh, problem, they listen to many strange people. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> and so this question is, how can you organize a consensus in a society where everybody has to give something? Some people, some more, some people will even benefit from it, but in the, in the, the good of the total, you will agree to that. How could, can you organize that still? I'm not. I'm observing in the future with interest. <laughs> On that note, um, we'll end it here. We're running out of time, but I want to thank both of you, David and Walter, so much for your insights and your contribution, and same goes to the audience. Thank you so much for this. Appreciate it.